DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Missionary Benedictines of Christ the King Priory, presents The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world, with Father Mauritius Vildi. Father Mauritius did his philosophical, theological, and doctoral studies in Rome. He is the author of numerous books, including I Want to Understand You, Encountering Foreign Worlds with a Little Prince, The New Image of God's Image, Meister Eckhart on Image and Theology, Peter and Paul, Models of Decision-Making, and On the Way, Benedict's Journey for Spiritual Maturity. Father Mauritius also serves as the prior of Sant'Anselmo in Rome. The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world, with Father Mauritius Vildi. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Mauritius. Thank you for having me. There's many aspects of the Holy Rule and life in the Benedictine monastery that aids in continual growth that is even outside of just living the rule. There are some really wonderful structures that help foster our learning community. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, The monks see themselves as a growing community, growing in the spirit, hopefully, and a learning community. So... Let me read out to you chapter 38 of the Holy Rule of St. Benedict, which is on the reader for the week. Reading will always accompany the meals of the brothers. The reader should not be the one who just happens to pick up the book, but someone who will read for a whole week, beginning on Sunday. After Mass and Communion, Let the incoming reader ask all to pray for him so that God may shield him from the spirit of vanity. Let him begin this verse in the oratory, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. And let all say it three times. When he has received a blessing, he will begin his week of reading. Let there be complete silence, no whispering, no speaking. Only the reader's voice should be heard there. The brothers should by turn serve one another's needs as they eat and drink, so that no one need ask for anything. If, however, anything is required, it should be requested by an audible signal of some kind rather than by speech. No one should presume to ask a question about the reading or about anything else, lest occasion be given to the devil. The superior, however, may wish to say a word, a few words of instruction. Because of Holy Communion and because the fast may be too long and too hard for him to bear, The brother who is the reader for the week is to receive some diluted wine before he begins to read. Afterward, he will take his meal with the weekly kitchen servers and the attendants. Brothers will read and sing not according to rank, but according to their ability to benefit the hearers. So there are some chapters in the Rule of St. Benedict that we don't, now today as monks, that we don't um, realize anymore or don't can live because they are so bound to their historic historical um, situation. This chapter, however, chapter 38, we really follow until today. So we We have this table reading every day, and we enjoy it. Why do we read at table? Why do we keep silence at table? You may wonder, because aren't meals a great place to share, to exchange, to communicate? The problem nowadays is that 
we don't have so much time really to share and we don't take the time to sit down for a meal and to have a meal together. So you may wonder, if you have this luxury to, to eat together, to sit together, why don't you speak? We don't speak because we want to listen to the table reading. And the idea behind is what Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what is a meal about? A meal is about being fed, eating, getting nourished. But we humans not only consists of a body, we have a soul and a mind. So we want to be fed even more, not only by bread and water and whatever we eat or drink. So this is the, the idea that the whole human being in all his dimensions is fed when we sit together and have the meal. Among many things in that particular section, that it wasn't according to rank, but it was more about ability to be able to uh, almost, can we say, prepare the word to be given. Right, because St. Benedict wants to make sure that that you really get food, so um, that you get that you are edified when you listen to a reader. He doesn't want to make down somebody who is not so good as a reader. I think at his times, in the 5th and 6th century, not everybody was able to read anyway. So that was a big deal if somebody was able to read and for the others to listen to these readings. It was of kind of an institution of learning. So the table reading was a great opportunity for the brothers to learn something. Does it stipulate precisely what is to be read, Father Mauritius? Yes, it does. <laughs> and this is very interesting. And until today it's not easy to choose the right table reading. In chapter 42, St. Benedict says, this is a chapter on silence after Compline, so not directly on silence during the meals, but anyway, we will see we will see pretty soon how he wants to go about with books. So in chapter forty two, Saint Benedict says, Monks should diligently cultivate silence at all times, but especially at night. Accordingly, this will always be the arrangement, whether for fast days or for ordinary days. When there are two meals, all the monks will sit together immediately after rising from supper. Someone should read from the conferences or the lives of the fathers, or at any rate something else that will benefit the hearers, but not the Heptatuch or the Book of Kings because it will not be good for those of weak understanding to hear these writings at that hour. They should be read at other times. Interesting. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Because uh, certain books and the images that uh, are included in those readings would probably... Um, what can I say, raise some fantasies or something that is not good for the brothers, especially at these late hours. Challenge purity, perhaps? Exactly, yeah. But this, I think that's not only a matter of purity, so in general, it's important what you eat. It, it, it matters what you eat, and this, the same is true for books. Because you eat with the eyes, you eat with your heart, and you want that this really benefits you, what you take in. I think this is, um, this is mainly what St. Benedict is concerned about, 
that at the right time we get the right spiritual food. Another point that it brings forward is the importance of not asking questions because it stipulates then potentially the devil can creep in. Sure, because it can be, for example, you don't understand something, what you hear, but maybe if you are just patient, wait a while, after, after a while you understand because you understand the context. If you would start speaking, you would break the silence and would hinder the others to listen to this reading. So this is one reason that you shouldn't ask. The second reason is that such kind of reading can be a cause for grumbling, and grumbling is something that St. Benedict really hates. Mm -hmm. So this is really grumbling is the devils are dancing on the table, so to speak. And so, for example, if you have a book that... Mm, points out something that you don't like or that you cannot bear, it can become pretty hard to listen to it. This is why I said, uh, until today, it's not easy to find a good table reading. There are things you cannot read at table. They are good to read for yourselves, for example. And then you have also to consider the the the, the range or the, the, how can I say, consider how different the monks are in a community. You have older monks, you have younger ones, you have all kinds of character, characters, and to find something that feeds everybody, it's almost so difficult like to cook for a whole family, <laughs> for a whole community, that everybody really likes what he eats. It's not easy. There's something about the shared experience too, isn't there? I mean, there was a time not so long ago that even with the experience of a family sitting watching television within the family, but now there's so many different options that that food is going in to all the other individuals and who knows the results of the fruit mm. from that. That is a wonderful thought. You are so right. Um, listen together unifies so, if it is true that we are not only nourished by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, that means that if we have a good table reading, it is kind of God or Christ who is speaking. So, finally, we all of us listen to one and the same voice. And this really connects and, and binds us together if you really hear and listen to one voice. And practically, it is an experience to listen to a good book. So we make an experience together. Let me share with you what kind of books we read. For example, travelogues. So we like to travel in our minds while we are stable at the place. Mm -hmm around the world. And we are missionaries too, so it's always great to learn from other countries and mm -hmm. from other cultures. This is something we like very much. We read historical books. One of our last table readings was on the Mayflower. It was a book uh, written by Nathaniel Philbrick. So there's always something to learn. We certainly read spiritual books. Here it is even a little bit more difficult to find the right, find the right one because mm -hmm. in a way you find different spiritualities and one in the same community. We like to listen to readings from the Pope. We, For example, one of our last readings was Light of the World. That was an interview conducted by Peter Seewald. He's a German that he did with Pope Benedict the 16th, wonderful book. We like to listen to biographies. Um, for example, we had a book on the sist missionary Benedictine sisters, um, the sisters in Norfolk, um, this, they belong to this congregation, and um, that was a book on their pioneer, pioneers, their foremothers, so the very first missionaries, it was, oh, it was such a great book to listen to what, what these women did. 
It, it was so encouraging. And so whoever has a good book or has found a good book can suggest this to the community and then we, we take it. And if we don't find a good one, then sometimes we ask other in other monasteries, what, what did you have as a table reading? And if we still have not a good one, then we look inside the pages by Chris McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll return in just a moment to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual guide for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, Tune in, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. Gloria St. Benedict, Sublime Model of Virtue, pure vessel of God's grace. Behold me humbly kneeling at your feet. I implore you in your loving kindness to pray for me before the throne of God. To you I have recourse in the dangers that daily surround me. Shield me against my selfishness and my indifference to God and to my neighbor. Inspire me to imitate you in all things. May your blessing be with me always so that I may see and serve Christ in others and work for his kingdom. Graciously obtain for me from God those favors and graces which I need so much in the trials, miseries, and afflictions of life. Your heart was always full of love, compassion, and mercy toward those who were afflicted or troubled in any way. You never dismissed without consolation and assistance anyone who had recourse to you. I therefore invoke your powerful intercession, confident in the hope that you will hear my prayers and obtain for me the special grace and favor I earnestly implore. Help me, great Saint Benedict, to live and die as a faithful child of God, to run in the sweetness of His loving will, and to attain the eternal happiness of heaven. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual guide for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. Because I'm sure that um, consultation with the other monasteries is a, is a wonderful way of mm -hmm. sharing that experience. Right. When we listen to those readings, we can learn something. This is why I said a Benedictine community is a learning community. And today we talk, we speak about learning organizations. So we know that an organization that is not continuously learning as an organization, as a community, will not survive. 
It is not enough to just individually learn something and to keep your brain going and, and learning. The whole organization, the whole community has, in a way, to learn and to continue to go and to grow. And the table reading is one important part of this. It's not the only part, but it's one, um, a good one. There is something, isn't there, Father Mauritius, to the experience of hearing, uh, especially when it, it comes to issues of faith. I think it was St. Thomas Aquinas that said that faith that comes through hearing pierces through a veil. Oh, yes. That is so true. It's a wonderful observation. We could sit together all together and just read in our books, but this would be different. To listen, to really hear to somebody, to his voice, and it's, it's a wonderful thought. I've never thought about this in this way, that listening to the, to the table reader nourishes our faith. What other thoughts can we um, pull from this particular aspect of the role? Mm -hmm. I think because the monasteries from the beginning wanted to be learning communities, it turned out that the Benedictines and the monastics became great teachers and run schools until today. Because the monks themselves understand themselves as students all the time. So in the prologue of St. Benedict of the Rule, St. Benedict writes, therefore we intend to establish a school for the Lord's service. So he understands the whole monastery as a school and kind of as a natural outflow, or natural outcome of this attitude of being learning people, the monks started to establish schools and hereby to uh, shape the culture and to even create a culture. When I mean, you look into the history of the Benedictines, there are so many great teachers. For example, St. Bede in the 7th century, St. Rabanus Maurus in the 8th century, Peter Dam Damian, Damian in the 11th century, Anselm of Canterbury. These all were monks, but also among the women, Hilda of Withby, Hildegard of Bingen, Gertrude the Great. These were all great teachers. And I, I guess they could become great teachers because they were humble enough never to stop learning. The names you just gave us are just a beautiful litany of the, of the Benedictines, a testament to the fruit of the stability in the community of all the things that we had talked about prior, that it created the soil, did it not, for the germination of this great, not only learning, but of teaching. Right. In this country, most of the Benedictines run schools or colleges, universities, seminar, seminar, seminaries, because we feel it is so important to prepare the right food for the people, to give them the right nourishment. It's so important. It's important for your mind to, to keep your brain alive. It's important to establish and to create a good and healthy culture. And it's in, important, as you said, for our faith. What we learn with our, head, with our minds is connected with what we believe. It would be difficult to have a healthy learning community too, would it not, if you didn't have the proper rest, if you didn't have the proper food, if there wasn't that sense of balance that gave you time for the study, but time to break off so you can ponder in chunks. Very much so. You cannot eat and eat and eat and eat. It's just not possible. You have to digest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and to rest. And you know what is strange? The scientists or the historians consider Albert the Great the last man on this earth who was able to keep all knowledge that was available at his time. So he was 
called the an universal doctor. So he is considered to be the one who was the last in the history who could keep all know-how that is around at all, in all areas, natural science, languages, history, whatever. Mm -hmm. And after him, what you could know, the knowledge, grew so much that nobody was able anymore to, to have everything. So that means that we nowadays have to pick and choose what we learn even to the point that we get a bit lazy because we, we think we, we cannot get it all anyway. <laughs> so why should I even start? And again, there is Google and Google always helps me and Google knows everything. Just ask the cloud <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or ask Wikipedia, which both means are great. Don't understand me wrong. But um, the problem is how do we deal with, with learning even more it is so important to learn the right things at the right time. And also, as you said, to pause with learning. The, here's the point. Google kind of shows only one dimension of learning. So click on humility. Click on Wikipedia, for example. Wikipedia, go to humility. Article on humility. Okay, you can read it. Maybe you are 16 years old and you read it. Do you think that you understand it? Who teaches you that, who teaches you at what time and what age you should read this article? What I want to say is 16 years would be a little bit, I would say, a little bit too early to, or maybe just not the right age to understand what humility means. But this Google wouldn't tell you, or Wikipedia wouldn't tell you. So it's just one dimensional what, what, what we find in the internet. But the way how to um, take ownership of this knowledge and to, to make it mine, or in other words, when to eat this at what time, this is a different story. And for this, you need actually experts, teachers, uh, wise people, spiritual directors that help you to find the right book at the right time. I may be saying something that for some might be potentially a little scandalous, if not provocative, in to, to the extent that you can be seduced into spiritual gluttony, could you not, with some that intensity to want to devour everything. I have seen this and... This is really a difficulty. I, I, I experienced a young man when I was the vocation director of the monastery who was extremely educated in terms of he knew almost every spiritual book. It was just incredible. And he was a young man. He was just 21 or so. I was impressed. I was impressed. I thought, wow. At that age, I didn't know so much. But here's the point. He had the problem. He couldn't get th through just reading into the real life. So how do I implement what I read into my spiritual life? This is a different story. Mm -hmm. So in, the way, in a way, you can be spoiled by reading too much or the wrong things at the wrong time. It does have some elements of Lexio to it, to the certain extent where you read a section. At least there's a segment of it. You're not rushing maybe through. I mean, just think of the things you might miss. Right. Any final thoughts on this particular section, Father Mauritius? Yes, maybe a, a story that I have experienced. Um, I have a confrere, a brother monk, Father Rabanus, in my home abbey in Germany. He's a wonderful man. He's really wise, incredibly knowledgeable. I would say he reads at least seven books a week or so. It's incredible what he is able to read. He's our one of our librarians. 
He reads all kinds of books. He knows always about the latest. <laughs> He's just incredible. And someday I, I did an interview with him, and that was about monastic life in general. So I asked him, do you like it in the monastery? Why, why are you still a monk? And one question was, did you never miss a wife? And he answered, and he really meant it, you know, what if I would have a wife? but no library. <laughs> it, it talks about vocation, doesn't it? It's right, all about vocation. right, right. Uh, one must say he is somebody who really gets along very well with women, so that's <laughs> not his problem. But you, you can see how attached he is in a positive way to reading and, and to the books. He really needs it as a nourishment for his soul. Mm -hmm. Father Mauritius, thank you so much. You're welcome. You've been listening to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, A Spiritual Path for Today's World with Father Mauritius Fildi. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with the Missionary Benedictines of Christ the King Priory in Scarlet, Nebraska. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for... The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world with Father Mauritius Vildi.